Well, I think we'll start and welcome uh, everybody um, to this uh, launch event for the UK anti slap Coalition uh, website, antislap.uk. Um, we're here to raise awareness and also to talk about the perennial problems which are slaps. And I'm really pleased that uh, I've been joined today by some exceptional talents. We've got Annelie, who's going to talk from Sweden, who's going to talk about uh, what happened to her as an investigative journalist. We've got Tamsin Allen, a partner at Vimans, who's going to talk about a case she was involved with. And we've got Jessica as well uh, from Index, who's going to talk about that. I'm also on the board of Index, as well as being a lawyer. And I'm my name's Mark Stevens, and I'm thrilled to be here uh, and joining everybody to facilitate this conversation. We thought the best thing to do was to start so that the audience has a clear understanding of everybody's position on this. So we're going to start in a moment with Annalie telling her story, and then we're going to move on to talk about uh, the wider issues of slaps and what we can learn from each of the cases and also from one another. And I would certainly invite you to make questions or comments in the chat so that I can weave those into the questions that we're going to ask today. So without any further ado, uh, welcome again. And Annalie, do you want to tell us a bit about your case, which was a slightly unusual one, because you were slapped uh, in Sweden? Yes. So thank you so much for inviting me. I have been working for as a freelance journalist for a couple of years. And 2020, me and another freelance journalist, Pera Agerman, started to investigate a Swedish businessman, Svante Kumlin, and his solar park company, EEW. We used public documents from courts, the company's own press releases and marketing material that we found online. We also used documents that we had received from uh, some shareholders of this company. So most of the information we presented was available to anyone that was interested to look into this. All in all, we published some 12 articles. During this period, Mr. Kamlin never agreed on an interview and never answered questions that were sent by email. Instead, he had his lawyers at the firm TLT contact us after the first article. The first email from the lawyers was sent on a Wednesday in October 2020. In that letter, they gave us two days to take actions. They required us to remove the articles from the website and delete any social media posts. We had to publish a suitable apology with equivalent prominence to the article and archive that uh, apology on the website so that it remained searchable. And we should also pay Mr. Camlin's legal costs. If we didn't comply, they threatened to sue us in England, despite the fact that we were Swedish, writing in Swedish for a Swedish newspaper and for Swedish readers. In this same first letter, they also said that we should be aware of the fact that Mr. Kamlin is a resident of Monaco, and that defamation is a criminal offense in Monaco and that we could be prosecuted in Monaco. The lawyer ended the letter uh, by- Emily, what, was, what was the article about? I think a lot of uh, uh, was, colleagues here today won't actually know. Yeah, okay. So the articles, it was uh, 12 uh, articles. We, we just wrote about his company, EEW. We wrote about his track record as a, as a businessman. We went 20 years back in time. Um, we found some, uh, we found that he was uh, in a conflict with a big Swedish bank and that he didn't, he hadn't paid 
tax uh, here the tax money we, we 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 found we it was uh it was an investigation in in uh, some a public uh, interest investigation public in yeah we are we are financial uh, we are financial uh, 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 reporters and he said that we he, he was uh, supposed he said that they would list the company in on a stock exchange in Norway and at the same time they said they were going to list the company in London and this didn't make sense to us so we just we went through his I mean 20 years back in time and we checked his companies in Australia we checked his companies in Cyprus we checked his company in the Netherlands so we did a huge oh. Marvellous. So it sounds like you did a good, thorough job on it. Yes, so you we were did. saying that the, the lawyers threatened to sue you for criminal libel in Monaco, um, uh, yes. which has the same French law on criminal libel. Yeah, it's actually there was another there was another uh, uh, company, a lawyer firm in uh, in Monaco that reached out to us, and. Uh, they said that we are the lawyers of uh, Svante Kamlin in Monaco, and you should know that you can get one year in jail here, and uh, except for huge penalties, blah, blah. So I was just thinking, I had a daughter at seven years old then, and I thought, shit, one year in prison. <laughs> I didn't want to leave my daughter at the time, but... Um, uh, my colleague Per said that that's just bullshit. They can, could never do that. But we don't know. However, that so was. Where did you find support then? Pardon? Where did you find support for your position? I'll, I will come to that. Okay. Okay. So, anyhow, uh, where were I? Uh, you, were, you were about to be arrested in Monaco and be away from your daughter for a year. <laughs> that was the threat. Okay, that was one threat. And we were also threatened oh, to... Tell us about all of them. Yeah, okay. But uh, I, I have to choose. I, you know, we have loads of email from, from this uh, CLT firm. Um, uh, well... They wanted us to, uh, uh, yeah, we, yeah, and in, in the end of this letter, they said that uh, they informed us that uh, Mr. Kamlin had no intention of responding to our questions and that we should desist from contacting Mr. Kamlin directly again. They didn't want, they didn't want our, uh, to contact we, us to contact them and uh, do more research and uh, they just did want they just wanted us to stop but anyhow we continued publishing our, our findings and after every article we received letters sometimes more than one from Kamling's lawyers which we perceived as very threatening they also tried to prevent us from doing research this is one example. We contacted an American company because it was uncertain whether Camlin had bought this American company or not. After that, we got an email from Camlin's lawyers uh, who requested that we urgently provided confirmation that we would desist from contacting the US company any further. Later on, they also tried to prevent us from taking uh, from talking to shareholders in this company, EEW. They wanted to pre prevent us from doing research. Anyhow, less than two months after the first article was published, Mr. Kamlin and the company sued me personally, my colleague Per personally, the editor-in-chief personally, and the newspaper Realtid for more than 13 million pounds and if you think about the feeling you would get if you were handled such a document where it says you are sued for 13 million pounds what would you feel would you wonder how that would affect your children would you wonder if this means you can't keep your home would you wonder what your husband or wife would say when they realize you have dragged them into something that might be very harmful for the family's economy would you be forced to live on a bare minimum for years? 
And these were exactly the questions that I uh, would ask myself during this period. But at the same time, we were very confident with our research and articles. The big problem was money. Newspaper Realtid is a tiny specialized financial online newspaper, which was as good as bankrupt at the time. It was bankrupt. So we knew the newspaper could never finance any expensive defense in England. That was one reason for us to speak out because we could not do it ourselves. We realized that we needed help. And I reached out to Jessica at Index on Censorship, who was the first one I reached out to. Uh, I found her on LinkedIn. I had read something she had wrote about SLAP and she responded immediately. She contacted lawyers. She said, this is serious. And I just, ah. Uh. She contacted lawyers who were willing to represent us under an agreement that they would get paid by the other party if we won but only until a hearing that focused on the forum, we tried to convince the judge that this case should not be tried in, in English court because we were Swedish, uh, but we succeeded only partially. So that hearing was not about whether our articles were true and in the public interest, it was about the forum. And after that hearing, Mr. Kamling was allowed to move forward with three articles out of eight. So now we needed approximately one million pounds for a full defamation trial. This was uh, before Christmas this year. Me and Per, uh, my colleague Per, we reached out to different organizations and, and funds trying to raise money for our defense, but found only 5,000 pounds, which weren't nearly enough. So before Christmas, not long before we were to put in our defense to the court, we reached out to Reporters Without Borders in Sweden. Me and Per wanted to launch a crowdfunding and Reporters Without Borders said that we were willing to, they were willing to help us with that. There were pros and cons to, to it. The disadvantage was that the counterparty would realize we had no money. The advantage was that we might get some money. <laughs> um, but the CEO and the newspaper's board of directors didn't want to take the risks that a full defamation trial would entail. If we were, for some reason, were to lose, everybody would get bankrupt. The newspaper, me, Per, and the editor-in-chief. So in the end, and just days before we were to put in our defense to the court, there was a settlement. Realtid published excuses above the three articles that were left in the process. It said, we didn't mean to say that Svante Kumlin had done anything wrong, but we stood by the publications and had not made any changes in the article. They were unamended. Svante Kumlin also agreed to pay some of the newspaper's legal costs that had arised between the first hearing and the settlement. So what did we gain by fighting for more than two years when it ended in a settlement? If you think the initial demands from Mr. Kamlin was to unpublish all the articles, apologize and never contact Svante Kumlin again. Now all the articles are still online and they are unamended. We have also been able to continue our investigation into EEW and published an article some weeks ago in a large Swedish daily newspaper owned by a large media group that would be able to defend us if we were to be sued again. We have also raised the awareness of SLAP in Sweden by speaking out very loudly, partly because we had to. We knew we couldn't do this by ourselves, and partly because we found this lawsuit to be unjust in every conceivable way. Well, I think that's obviously right, Annelie, and thank you for that. And I think that we'll probably hear some parallels from Tamsin, uh, Tamsin Allen, who is a lawyer, 
a uh, very experienced lawyer. Now, you uh, were dealing with the Nina Cresswell case, Tamsin, um, and you could you tell us a bit about that and so that we can start to draw out and see some of the parallels? Of course, thank you. So the case I'm here to talk about is unusual in that it's um, not a case that, that um, relates to journalism at all. Um, doesn't relate to any publication in the usual in the usual sense of the word. It's not unusual, sadly, in that I hear all the time from abuse survivors who are being sued or threatened to being sued by their abusers. Um, those cases very rarely come to trial. There is no support at all, usually, for the um, defendant. They're very difficult. Um, and the law isn't really well adapted to deal with those sorts of cases because so few have gone to court. So it's both a very unusual case and a sadly familiar situation. So Nina was um, my client. Uh, for what, another unusual thing about Nina is that from the very start, she waived her right to anonymity. And survivors of sexual assault normally have a right to an, lifelong right to anonymity. And Nina decided that the purpose, of the, the pur her purpose was to highlight what had happened to her um, get accountability um, and warn other women. And she thought that purpose couldn't be achieved unless she was prepared to out herself. And she knew that this could mean, you know, that her name would be associated with this man's name forevermore. Um, it was a big decision to take, a very brave decision. Um, 13 years ago, when she was a young woman of 19, celebrating the end of her second year at university, she met a tattooist in a club, a um, friend of a friend of hers or friend of a, someone she knew. Um, everyone was drinking, celebrating. It got to four o'clock in the morning or so. She was walking home and this man offered to walk her home. Um, she knew he was a friend of a friend. He went with her part of the way and seriously and violently sexually assaulted her. And she escaped um, and ran home partially dressed and was extremely terrified. She still had been drinking all night in a terrible state. She rang the police as soon as she got into the house and the police came within a couple of hours and immediately decided they didn't believe her. There was no crime had been committed. They weren't even going to investigate. And they suggested that because she said it was like a nightmare, that she was having dreams of being raped. It was quite extraordinarily um, uh, negligent response by the police. That sounds almost like the fantasy of a policeman. Uh, it was really bad. I mean, really, but the fact these were two female police officers, but they may well have been, you know, we know about police culture. Um, it was, they, they just, I mean, I think more likely they simply thought this is going to be difficult. It's not going to be lead to a prosecution easily. Let's get it off our books. We don't want to look like we've got a failed investigation. Let's not even go there. Um, so uh, Nina then um, had to shut shut it down. She tried to talk to friends about it. She tried to find out more and got nowhere. People were really, found it, you know, didn't really want to help her, um, apart from a few close friends. So she didn't talk about it again. It festered, it was difficult for her. She lived with it for many years, feeling traumatized by what had happened, you know, scared of people who looked like Billy Hay, the man who'd attacked her, scared of all sorts of things. Then after the global Me Too movement emerged, a sort of sub-movement called Tattoo Me Too emerged. And Nina had been, one of the reasons she'd been so traumatized is because she felt so bad that this had happened to her this man had access to women's bodies to tattoo them, and she'd never warned anyone about him. Um, this, uh, the, the Tattoo Me Too movement gave her courage to think that there was a wider purpose in her naming him. It wasn't like a, a situation where it was an ex-boyfriend, there was beef between them. This was a stranger to her, not that it makes you know, much difference, um, but there was no possible motive for her other than accountability and proper public interest in warning other women about this person who could be dangerous. Um, so she put, she, after a lot of thought and a lot of um, fear, she made a statement on um, social media. I mean, she started by trying to contact the um, business partner of, the, of Billy Hay, the man who'd attacked her, um, but didn't get anywhere. So she thought, I've got nothing left to me. The police have failed me. Business partner's not interested. 
my only route now is to go public on social media. I mean, she didn't have a huge number of, so I think she had under a thousand followers, but it was very important to her that this was a message that would get out somehow. So she put it on her social media. Um, feeling briefly uh, pleased with what she'd done and proud of the steps she'd taken, um, the last thing she expected was a lawyer's letter. But quite soon afterwards, she received a letter from lawyers acting for Billy Hay, claiming that everything she'd said was a complete fantasy, that she'd made it up. All that happened was that they danced and chatted in groups. And uh, this whole um, description that she'd given, the detailed description she'd given was invented. And this was obviously a, a really traumatizing for her, have nobody believe her. Um, he also went to the police and claimed this was a criminal offence, a malicious communication um, and harassment of him and made a police complaint. Um, at the same time, she'd gone back to the police, this was 10 years after the event, to say, can you now investigate this thing that happened to me 10 years ago? Um, so she found herself both being investigated and the complainant in an investigation in the criminal arena. No, uh, the, the claim against her, the, the complaint against her was dismissed, but unfortunately the police again said, sorry, not enough evidence, this is too difficult, it's one person's word against another, we haven't got any external evidence at all. So Nina then, for the first year, was representing herself, facing a libel claim from this man, and unable to find any support, any legal support. Um, she then went she uh, came to me through former clients of mine who had been in a very similar position. And there's a reason for that, the reason why these cases are common, in my view. The process of a libel claim is, seems to suit a coercive, controlling character very well. They have access to the power of the state, the power of the court. They can use a lawyer to send intimidating messages. The defendant's in a very difficult position, as we all know, in a, libel, in a libel claim. They can't just say, okay, I've had enough without having to debase themselves and apologize, which is something Nina felt she could never do um, in this circumstances. So she felt she was trapped. Um, and that's something that someone who has been abusive in the past may enjoy, or uh, you know, that having all that power over somebody. So, I had another group of um, young women uh, who came to me um, for advice after they were sued uh, by a man they've made allegations about, and they had a campaign called Solidarity Not Silence, which is how Nina found out about them. She came to me, and for a long time, we were um, in some difficulty. Um, the burden is on the defendant to prove, the, to, to establish a defense. To prove what had happened was true was going to be hard. It was 13 years ago, two sets of police officers had not believed it. There was no external evidence at all, no CCTV, no witnesses. Um, although Nina had uh, messages, contemporaneous messages, confirming, uh, explaining what had happened to her when she messaged friends, not all the messages were completely consistent, as you might expect with somebody who's traumatized and recovering from an attack. But there were difficulties for her um, and she would have to prove on the balance of probabilities but in a case like this where you're making very serious allegations you have to prove with convincing evidence the court takes the view that the worse the allegation is the more the stronger the evidence has to be so it's not as simple as just you know 51 percent likelihood she so those were the hurdles she faced um, now she was a unusually um, determined person. Um, she'd already, as I said, decided to use her own name. It had taken her a long time um, and she wasn't about to give up. She was uh, infuriated by the lawyers and Billy Hay. And about halfway through the, uh, the time of the course of the case, it suddenly emerged that Billy Hay had made an admission to the police when they were interviewing him, which one which his lawyers had not told us about, which was that he had left the club with her. He had gone to kiss her, in his words, and she had uh, moved away, and he claimed that was all that had happened. But this was very important. It was contrary to what he'd said before. It changed the balance 
in Nina's favor. Enough for us to say, okay, let's go for it. Let's uh, have a truth defense and a public, def public interest defense. It remained very difficult. We had funding um, help from Good Law Project who publicized Nina's, put up a crowdfunder for her and helped to publicize it. So we began to get some money to fund the work we were doing and um, Jonathan Price, who was her barrister, and we got to trial. At trial, we again got lucky with a very good judge. Um, the, the, Nina was a wonderful witness. Who, who was the judge? Heather Williams. Oh, wonderful, yeah. I mean, a very experienced uh, in this area. For those who don't know, Heather Williams spent a lot of her career um, representing people who were making complaints against the police. And she, more than almost anyone in the country, knows not to trust the police decisions on a case like this. So that was really helpful because there are plenty of other judges who would have said, oh, well, the police said there was nothing in it. That's that for me. So you, you said that she was an excellent witness, which is wonderful. What was the verdict? So the, um, she was great. The, he, he and his witnesses were, no, were, were, were poor. The judgment, um, when it came, found for Nina... Um, on all the defences, but found that it was true that she had, in fact, been violently sexually assaulted, exactly as she described in her post. And, importantly, that her saying so was protected by a public interest defence. Now, that's a defence which all journalists and writers Absolutely. will be very familiar with, but it's unusual to use it in the context of two private individuals talking about each other on social media. And the defence is not really developed to cater for that sort of situation. So it was important that the court gave guidance for people in that situation, which it did. And um, the judge said that uh, in circumstances like this, um, firstly, uh, the usual journalistic requirements of contacting the other side for comment, as Annalie tried to do in her investigations, is not required where it's a person making an allegation of this sort. Um, the judge explained how um, the tone of the writing, which normally has to be sort of measured and fair, didn't need to be where it's a, a victim of abuse describing what happened to her. Of course, the tone will be different there. So what the judge did was to slightly readapt or reconstitute the defense. It hasn't fundamentally changed, but this is how law works. This is how the common law works. This is how um, judges interpret statute. Uh, slightly rejigged re it to make it more suitable for defending someone in Nina's position, who is sadly one of many, many people threatened with libel proceedings by people who have um, abused them. Well, that's incredibly uh, heartening story. Uh, Tamsin, and thanks for sharing it, and thanks for the bravery of Nina, that's amazing. And also, the way you've presented that case has obviously moved the law along and show, moved the dial in a really important way. And uh, I really wanted to come now to Jessica uh, Nevan Neen, and uh, Jess, you, um, I think it would be really useful to talk about you know, how we bring all of this information together and how we can move the dial further on SLAPS. <clears throat> thanks, Mark, and a big thanks to Annalee and Tasman as well for, for speaking about this. And I think some of the words that we've heard mentioned so far are, we've heard a lot of unusual and we've also heard a brave. And while these two cases that Annalee and Tasman have outlined are actually very different in terms of, you know, the, the content, they're very similar as well because they involve... Um, individuals who were speaking out on a matter of public interest and who and efforts were made to silence them and that's what all slaps have in common really um, and I think um, Mark you said at the beginning as well that these cases uh, uh, well Annalie you said it about Annalie's case and I think Tasman you said it about, your, about um, Nina's case that they were unusual and I think the cases themselves maybe might not be unusual um, that's something that you picked up on Tasman but I think what's actually unusual about them is that we're hearing about them in the first place, that these involve, you know, bra really brave and, um, you know, um, determined individuals. And that's how we're hearing about them. And unfortunately, for the most part, that's not the case. And that's something that, um, you know, we've tried to do in the UK Anti-SAP Coalition um, is to bring more cases like this to light. 
Um, so just to give a bit, a little bit of background about the the coalition, uh, which um, we're, um, you know, we're launching the website up today, which we're very excited to do to really put a spotlight on more of these cases. Um, so in 2020, um, Susan Coftry at Foreign Policy Center and I began discussing the idea of um, establishing a, an informal network of individuals and organizations inter uh, interested in SLAPs in the UK. So Index had been working on SLAPs um, in the EU and UK since the end of 2019, and Foreign Policy had been undertaking, un Foreign Policy Centre had been undertaking their Unsafe for Scrutiny project. And we knew that London was a really, you know, a serious SLAP hub. Um, even though most people we spoke to um, hadn't heard of SLAP, and, and um, if they had, they weren't really too sure about what it was. Um, so we had our work, I suppose, in a way cut out for, for ourselves um, there, and we began by setting up the coalition, which had its first uh, meeting in January 2020, and we've been growing in number and strength since then. And it's currently chaired by, as well as Foreign Policy Centre and in Index on Censorship, also by in English Pen, and has nearly 30 active members at the moment. So, you know, as we've heard um, from these cases, one of the aims of a slap is really to isolate and intimidate the targets into silence. And so by establishing this coalition, this network, we really wanted to make it more difficult for, for targets to be to be isolated and to be silenced. So we, we kind of set out um, some main goals for the coalition. Uh, firstly, to share information about SLAPs um, that were linked to the UK or filed in the UK, um, to undertake joint advocacy and engagement around SLAPs, um, to undertake joint initiatives around regulatory and legal reform, which is really important in this. And then, of course, to provide guidance and practical support to those facing SLAPs, which luckily we were able to do. And Lee, as you mentioned in your case, it was actually the first one that we worked on as a, as a coalition. We also attended the jurisdiction hearing, which took place in um, in, Jan in March 2021 in that case. Um, so all of these things that are really aimed at, at supporting um, the individuals. And so we've made a lot of progress since the coalition was established. Basically, can um, I just interrupt there a moment? Is it, you, you're talking about support for people who are attempting to be slapped and censored. Is there a, a dimension to this where, you know, really experienced lawyers like Tamsin and her counsel, Jonathan Price, uh, can share legal knowledge with lawyers perhaps in Monaco or Sweden or even in London and the UK, where they've not had as much uh, experience as, say, Tamsin. Yeah, I think the whole, I think information sharing about this in general is really important. Um, I mean, we've seen a lot of, um, in the UK in particular, I suppose, more so um, cross-border slaps as well, like uh, such as Annelie's case. Um, and um, that's an important aspect of it. But, you know, I think in terms of information sharing, we know that the cases that have come to our attention are really only scratching the surface. Um, and so, you know, encouraging others to speak out. And Lee, you've been really robust about that, about encouraging other people to speak out. And I think that's really important, actually. Um, and something that, you know, it, it, it does involve a certain amount of bravery. It shouldn't, but it does. And hopefully, you know, we can help as a coalition. Um, we we want to help um, individuals can, to do so. Can you just, because this is a question I want to ask Anneli and Tamsin as well. What are the benefits of amplifying and coming out, if you like, uh, and calling out slaps? What, what, what's the impact of that? Anneli, do you want to go first? Well, I was just asking you, Jess. If oh, it, if sorry, I saw that Anneli was going to speak. I think one of the benefits is um, it, it's a, it's a um, it's kind of the opposite of what the slap litigant expects and what they're intending to do. And I think that's the biggest it's benefit opposite of what it. they want. And, and what they want exactly so in that in that sense i mean we've seen cases where we have when we've helped to put it out in the open that it has stopped the slap litigant in their tracks basically they they have there's been no further communication after it's been put out in the open so i think um that is the really uh you know that's an important part of it and actually we've had some i suppose um conversations with lawyers as well about this um uh, you know solicitors and they're not always in favor of it which makes our job maybe a little bit um more difficult uh, when we're kind of saying no you should you, you should go public and their solicitors are maybe saying well maybe not maybe it's not a good idea and of course you know we don't want to encourage people to well, the lawyers will know that they're in the public eye as well and they'll be in the crosshairs uh, yes. uh hence they're being shy and retiring on occasion Annalie um can we just talk a bit about 
what you what was the benefit of calling out uh, Mr. Camlin publicly? Whether that um, helped you with your ability to report uh, truthfully and openly? You're on mute. Um, okay. Yeah, our idea was that that we wanted to shout out from the rooftops about this because this this felt so unjust. We we were we were working in Sweden with uh, the Swedish laws under the Swedish laws, and all the ninety nine percent of the readers were were Swedish, and then he just. Uh, uh went to to london because it suited him because he he was able to it suited him in any way in in a lot of way so well, but, i mean we know that in london um two the two main things one the costs are oppressive it's going yeah, to cost you yes. you know 200 to 500 thousand for a smallish case and up to a million for something more and also um you have to be a bit of a moron in a hurry to lose a libel case or you have to be quite spectacular in Tamsin's case to win one in London because yeah. the law is so favorably uh, tilted towards mm -hmm. the claimant. But you know another thing in Sweden I can't get sued as a journalist. Uh, you can only be sued if you are is an editor-in-chief and uh, so, so me, me, I as a writer, I as a journalist, I can't be sued in Sweden. That's why he did, had to do it in London. Mm. Uh, I mean, but then, so, so but just Tamsin, I'd like to bring you in partly on this, you know, London being the slap centre of the world. Yeah, yeah. Um, and also, um, you know, in Nina's case, what did she get out of it in relation to the publicity, because that's an important issue yeah, well, here. The thing is, uh, well, we... Can I hear from Tamsin next? Sorry, So, the, so the, um, the value of going public and having support with going public, um, it, obviously there is a risk. Um, if you are a defendant in a libel claim and you go public saying, this is what I said, you may be aggravating the damage done to the claimant. It may cost you. So every, all lawyers will be cautious and say, be careful, what you're doing is risky. But notwithstanding that, if your client is trying, if someone is trying to silence your client um, and what's the purpose of their claim, then there's something quite fitting about exposing what they're trying to do and making a noise about it. It can also shift the balance of risk for the claimant. Their purpose is to shut you down and their purpose is to um, vindicate their reputation. If their reputation is going to be more damaged by bringing proceedings than by not bringing proceedings, that might shift the balance of risk for them in a way that dissuades them from continuing. Now, it isn't a straightforward uh, strategy and you need careful advice on it. And I would say that I'd say, to, you know, talk to a lawyer, but I think it's important. Um, there is another very important uh, benefit which is funding um libel cases are very expensive the financial risk is enormous most people can't afford to bring a libel claim uh, we do you know as mark knows lots of lawyers will do um, no win no fee agreements but only against defend only against a party who can pay up at the end if you have parties who are not going to be able to pay up you're not going to get money out of them that arrangement doesn't work so how can they be funded often only through crowdfunding. Crowdfunding won't be successful unless it's accompanied by a really good media strategy. So yeah. it's very important for both those purposes to, that the, the, there is a, a channel to make a noise through. Yeah, so can I go to Jess next and just say, Jess, you know, um, can you talk a bit about the impact of highlighting slaps and also perhaps a bit about the um, perception of slaps always being from rich and famous and powerful uh, folk. Yeah, absolutely. I think so. The, the Russia's invasion of Ukraine um, last year helped raise the profile of oligarchs taking legal action against UK journalists. And I suppose there was a particular focus on the cases against Catherine Belton and Elliot Higgins in the wake of that. 
But in the coalition, we've been really keen to emphasize that slaps are not only just against oligarchs, as we you know see here, that um you know that that they're not even only against journalists, and that's something that we're you know keen to to highlight as well. And and I suppose in terms of the impact of us speaking about this. Um, I mean, we've had we've undertaken many activities um, since we've begun, um, including events. We've had um, um, two anti sap conferences in London. We've issued statements and Council of Europe alerts. And we've had more than 70 um, leading editors, journalists, lawyers and academics endorse the, the coalition's model anti slap law, which was spearheaded by our co-chair, um, Charlie Holt. And, and I think one of, um, you know, in response to this, luckily, we have seen that the government has proposed, um, uh, you know, an anti slap uh, to bring forward anti slap legislation um, last July. We're still hoping that they will, you know, follow through on that soon. And we've also seen a warning notice from the Solicitors Regulatory Authority. So, again, bringing in the role of solicitors in this as well um, in, involved in taking action. Um, so I think hopefully with this website now as well, it will bring um, it will bring new attention and, and really just have a have a, a bit of a one stop shop, I suppose, for everyone who is interested in slaps, maybe, you know, and especially I think targets and slap litigants alike, you know, we're saying to them, we're here, you know, to the slap litigants, we're here to call out the abuse, abuse of litigation. And to the slap targets, we're, we're here for support. So um, if there is anyone on the call or if you know of anyone who is affected by slaps, we can be reached out to there. It's info at um, antislap.uk. Um, and there's also a tool online, especially for journalists, to help them identify a slap, because that's also an important that's, aspect. That, that's really helpful, Jess. And I think that's a great takeaway. Um, I, I'd like to talk about uh, the legislative reform that you referred to earlier. But before I do that, I'd just like to ask Tamsin, uh, and perhaps if you want to contribute as well, Jess, about um, the guidance, because one of the more innovative approaches has been um, uh, the regulatory authority for lawyers. Tamsin, do you want to say a few words about that? If I can unmute, yes. Um, so the so the Solicitors Regulatory Authority, which uh, provides guidance for the behaviour of solicitors and does have power to uh, punitive powers against solicitors if they breach its rules, has given guidance about when how solicitors should act. And they actually conducted an investigation where they came round to firms act, uh, operating in my area and asked us all, you know, are you acting for any oligarchs or are you defending any um, poor journalists who are being bullied by oligarchs and do you think you ought to be a bit careful? Um, so that was a, it was very welcome. There was a good, you know, a fairly senior person conducting these investigations and they were actually doing something. But interestingly, when I said, well, I don't have any oligarch client, when I unusually do both claimant and defendant work, so I see it from both, both sides, but I don't have any oligarch clients. My clients tend to be impoverished and um, I didn't have any uh, slaps running then in the normal sense of the word, but I said, have you ever considered these cases about abusive, usually men, and abuse victims who are just private individuals? And they said, no, they'd never thought of that. Um, and it was were very encouraged me to report solicitors acting in those sorts of cases to them. Um, and so that's a message. Uh, there's, uh, there's that message which should go to lawyers that don't dis, don't dis, don't discount those sorts of cases. They also may come within the ambit of the regulator. It's also a message to the courts because, again, in Nina's case, the lawyers were not uh, the uh, the lawyer or the barrister on the other side tried to cross-examine Nina about her past sexual history, um, and had to be stopped by the judge, um, even though we'd said to him don't go there, you've mentioned these issues with her previous boyfriend, don't go there. And if you're going to ask us about it, and they ignored that and went ahead anyway, that's an issue which the court and lawyers need to be, in, you know, change their behavior. We also applied for special measures for Nina. So we applied to have her screened uh, so she didn't have to see him. Um, and the court agreed that, but we had to slightly invent a procedure, um, adapt it from the criminal court and we had a, the judge who heard it said, well, that sounds sensible, um, ask the trial judge. But there is no easy way um, or guidance for how to deal with abuse victims who are being cross-examined by their abusers in the context of a libel trial. Yeah, because I mean, you know, we have seen this issue where um, particularly high profile paedophiles and such like have threatened, you know, Rolf Harris who passed away yesterday, Max Clifford, 
um, all of these people have um, tried legal threats as a way of um, stifling their victims ability to speak up. Jess, I wanted to ask you about um, the issues of um, lawyers and their professional obligations as well. How's that feeding into your campaign? Yeah, I think that's a really important part of it as well, because I suppose very often lawyers are are referred to as the enablers of this kind of um, you know legal harassment. And I think it is really encouraging that, um, you know, the likes of the SRA has issued this, uh, you know, that the SRA has issued this warning notice because it's also being um, heeded or, you know, a notice is being taken in other jurisdictions as well. So I know from um, undertaking work on SLAPs, for instance, in Ireland also, um, you know, speaking to people there, they have um, seen it being very, you know, uh, being an encouraging step. So I think this is about um, also an exercise in, uh, you know, all of these measures are also an exercise in awareness raising and um, <clears throat> telling um, lawyers, you know, this is this is an issue. We're watching. Uh, we're, we're kind of watching you. So please, you know, uphold the the um, the code of conduct um, that, that you've committed to. So I think that's a really important aspect of it. And I think that, you know, one of the things about that is uh, one of the reasons I'm in Helsinki today is to uh, spread that professional guidance more broadly. I'm uh, meeting with the International Bar Association who issue uh, guidance internationally for um, lawyers and proper practice. And what's interesting is the universality of the uh, obligations, the obligation not to mislead. So not to leave out the vital piece of information that uh, Nina Lake's abuser had had, uh, had not given um, vital pieces of information where they're threatening. So they're making bellicose threats as they did to Annalee um, in relation to, you know, a year in jail, those kinds of things. Because we all know nobody in Monaco or indeed France has been to jail in recent living memory uh, for speaking. And the uh, European Court of Human Rights have uh, affirmed that, but not everybody who receives letters from lawyers knows that, particularly people in person. And so one of the things that I'm advocating for here is that those same standards that we universally recognize for lawyers about not misleading, not abusing their position, should actually be transposed into international law. So sort of watch this space on that. Um, uh, I did want to come back to you, Jess, um, on the legislation, and then I'm going to ask Annalie about uh, things that she thinks can uh, be used to um, improve uh, the position for journalists and victims of slabs. So do you want to talk to us about the legislative reform that uh, the anti slap coalition is is promoting? Yeah, so I suppose the key, just a, a very kind of simple um, overview of the legislation, it's really about um, balancing the playing field at the moment, which is so skewed, um, you know, in favour of the, the slap litigant. And um, it's really about getting rid of one of the, the things that we see about slaps is that is the costs aspect of it and the time and those really combine to, um, you know, exert a huge pressure on um, the individual facing the slap. So that's what the legislation is basically focusing on. Um, is focusing on, you know, um, reducing those as much as possible and making it easier for the for the defendant to engage that it, they don't have to be in the case of Nina and Annalee, you know, they don't have to be exceptional individuals, brave individuals to to defend their cases. It should be, you know, a matter of course um, for individuals to do that. And you mentioned before we came on that you would have liked to have had your day in court to actually defend the the action that you were facing, uh, and you know that that wasn't possible just um, you know partially due to the costs that were involved. So, um, yeah, that's something that uh, that we want to fix with the legislation. Yes, and I think it's this sort of uh, I mean, part of the slap process is the attempt to cause maximum disruption. So. You know, Annalie, part of the threats from multiple jurisdictions for you seem to be about trying to distract you from doing further investigatory work on uh, Mr. Camlin. And that seems to be, you know, even if he win, doesn't win his case, um, you're going to have to pay a price for covering him. Is that sort of right? You're on mute. 
it, it actually affected us. It, uh, we, we tried to keep on uh, investigating his company, but, but it really did affect us because our lawyers said, be careful, be careful. So for a couple of months, we didn't publish anything, wait until blah, blah. And then of course, of course, if you have been slapped and now you're continuing to investigate it, of course we are, I mean, uh, of, of course we are, it's something something special when, when you investigate somebody who has already slapped you and sued you for 13 millions. So you, you get very, uh, you, you, it, it is very effective. It is very effective, but at the same time, the articles we wrote at Realtid, not many people wrote, read them, but uh, you know, his, he slapping us, that was, he got much more attention because of that. They wrote about it in The Guardian, the, I have been in, in um, Al Jazeera, have interviewed me and everything, and uh, all the big, big newspapers in Sweden have, have written about it. So he got a loads of attention because of his him slapping us. Yeah, I mean, I think what's interesting is that um, the, I think the original slap case, uh, Tamsin may have an older one, but I think it was probably McDonald's suing London Greenpeace, the so-called McLibel case, which went all the way up to our House of Lords and then off to the European Court of Human Rights. And that was McDonald's who um, objected to 35 leaflets handed outside their head office, not even a, a burger bar, but the head office in London. And uh, by the time it was over, it had been translated into 35 languages, this leaflet, and seen by you know, tens of millions of people, uh, which is probably not what they wanted when they started their libel action. And I, I do think that this sort of publicity element is quite important. Um, Tamsin, you, 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 do, you, do you think there's, a, what are the sort of reform things you think we should be looking for? Well, it's, uh, the sort of technical nature of the law is, um, I don't think, personally, I think it needs tinkering, not fundamental reform. I may differ from some others on that, but I think that broadly it's reasonably fair, providing both parties have uh, the funding to continue and lawyers. Uh, if they're in that situation, then very often um, they can slug it out in court. The problem becomes when there's an imbalance of power. Um, between the individuals, or neither of them are represented, or one isn't represented at all. Um, yeah. And then the law, the, the, the shortcomings in the law are exposed, um, and the unfairness in the system is is exposed. So I think that then uh, the interesting thing about McDonald's is that one point that went to the um, European Court was the lack of um, legal aid. And there was a, a, a finding that legal aid should or was available in principle to fund libel cases. It's never awarded in practice. I know of only one case, which was in fact a very bizarre case for it to be awarded, never in any other case. We tried to apply for legal aid for Nina and failed. And I know some other projects like Gemini and Public Law Project are working on trying to get legal aid. Well, awarded. given that they were represented by our future Prime Minister, Keir Starmer, Casey, <laughs> uh, hopefully he will see it within his gift when he takes power to uh, improve things for uh, people who are powerless and are being slapped and abused. Um, Jess, I wanted to give the final word uh, to you um, uh, to talk about, um, you know, if you're slapped, what should you be doing? Um, and, you know, whether you want support for your legislation, both here and in, uh, in Europe and other parts of the world. Yeah, absolutely. So if thanks, Mark, if um, if you if there is someone who's facing a slap, we'd really encourage you to visit. So we have this new resort, you know, all these resources on our new website. Um, so um, anti slap UK um, and you can also contact us there, um, as I said, at info at anti slap UK. And so, you know, please do reach out to us, even if you have a question. 
and that's something and we also have a mailing list um set up on the website which you can join so we will be you know um periodically sharing information about our progress with the campaign there also so please do sign up um and um you know it could be ways as well that we um we will use the mailing list to support individuals if they are doing things like fundraising for example might be one of the ways going forward that we might use it um, so as I say, solidarity and support is key. I think that has been really, um, you know, something that has come through in Anneli and Tasman's, um, you know, um, interventions. So um, please uh, keep in touch with us so we can uh, include you in our in our network of solidarity and support. Well, that's an absolutely wonderful place to finish. So takeaway for um, people who are joining us is please do sign up uh, to receive the mailing lists uh, from the anti slap coalition um and uh the details of that are in the chat and also look at the model legislation and i perhaps would like add a, a personal exhortation which is um let's try and get this legislation passed in europe as well just because we've brexited doesn't mean that you know poor vulnerable folk should be abused by the rich and powerful in europe if they, uh, if we manage to get our legislation through too. So with that, I just want to thank Annalie Ostland. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today and sharing your story. Uh, Tamsin Allen from Bynman's. Obviously, if you've got a case, go and see Tamsin. She's the woman for you. And uh, Jessica Nivanin uh, from the coalition please uh, do stay in touch with all of them and keep us sharing the information about this abusive use of the law. With that, I'm going to close the session and thank you all very much. Thank you, Mark. Thank you.